morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the UK, to London, and to the Royal Society. It's uh, a real pleasure on behalf of the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Royal Society to welcome you to this symposium, which is the first in a series on synthetic biology, and it's jointly organised by six academies, the six national academies of science and engineering of the US, the UK, and China. Among other things, that makes it a unique series of events, and uh, we're very pleased that we've been able to bring it forward in this way. Uh, I think it's important that we can have that kind of cooperation both now and in the future. This symposium series brings together key scientists, engineers, and policymakers from academia, government, and industry from three of the leading countries in this fast-moving global area of research. As the National Academies, of course, for science and engineering, our role is to use the expertise of our fellowships to guide careful and informed thinking, influence public policy, and make and provide a forum for a meaningful exchange of ideas. And that's the main purpose in undertaking this series of symposia, uh, to provide just that open platform to discuss some of the key challenges and opportunities that synthetic biology uh, presents, an exciting field of research. Synthetic biology, uh, it has often been argued, has the potential to revolutionise our way of life by impacting on sectors as diverse as food, energy, healthcare and, of course, far beyond. That's why this series has con been conceived as a series, with each uh, symposium in a different country having a slightly different theme in the entire area. This symposium, entitled The Economic and Social Life of Synthetic Biology, aims to examine the rhetoric and uh, what lies behind that rhetoric, the reality in other words, how the economic and social benefits that may derive from synthetic biology have been realised to date and will be realised in the future. We hope to explore future directions in the development of the subject and ask what mechanisms there are and what might be necessary to support the emergence of new technologies and applications. I'm, of course, extremely delighted we have such a distinguished cast of international experts to help us in this task. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of our participants, especially the delegations from our sister academies in the US and China, as well as, of course, to others who've travelled from overseas to be with us. Uh, of course, it's also true this event could not take place without the generosity of several sponsors, so I'd also like to warmly thank the Centre for Synthetic Biology and Innovation, the Medical Research Council, the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, and finally, Tate and Lyle, for their generous support of the event. It's now my pleasure to introduce the co-chairs for this event who will take you through the proceedings. First of all, Professor Ledley is the Herschel Smith Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge in the UK and is co-founder of the Cambridge-based biotech company Bio Biotica. His research concerns the natural pathways for biosynthesis of antibiotics and how they might be tailored to produce novel therapeutics. He studied chemistry at Oxford and then at ETH in Zurich and he's a recipient of various awards, including the Cher Internationale de Recherche at Blaise, uh, Blaise Pascal, held at the Institut Pasteur Paris in France, the American Chemical Society Remsen Award in 2006, the Smets Chair at Louvain, Louvain in 2009, and a Humboldt Prize in this year. And he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in the year 2000. The second co-chair is Professor Richard Kitney, who is a Professor of Biomedical Systems Engineering at Imperial College London, also Chairman of the Institute of Systems and Synthetic Biology and co-director of the EPSRC Centre for Synthetic Biology and Innovation. 
He's been a visiting professor at MIT since 1995 and is co-founder and chairman of Visibon Limited, which is a biomedical information systems company. Richard is a fellow of the World Technology Network and was made an academician of the International Academy of Biomedical Engineering in 2003. Richard was chair of the Royal Academy of Engineering Inquiry into Synthetic Biology, entitled Synthetic Biology Scope, Applications and Implications, and is a member of the Royal Society Working Party on Synthetic Biology. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 1999 and was appointed to the Order of British Empire for Services to Information Technology in Healthcare and Biomedicine in 2001 two very well-qualified and distinguished experts to chair your proceedings. At that point, it's uh, time for me to hand over to Professor Kitney, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. And all that remains for me is to wish you all a very enjoyable, thought-provoking, and stimulating two days. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, it's a very great pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker because I've known uh, Dr. George Post for many years and consider him to be a very good friend. Uh, George, at the moment, is Chief Scientist uh, uh, at the Complex Adaptive Systems Initiative at, the, at Arizona State University, where he also holds the Dell Webb Professor of Health Innovation Chair. Um, earlier, uh, from 2003 to 2009, he directed and built the Biodesign Institute at the, uh, at the same university. So, so George has a distinguished um, uh, academic career, which of course is still ongoing. However, in addition, uh, from, two, uh, from 1992 to 1999, uh, George was uh, Chief Science and Technology Officer and President of R&D at Smith Klein Beecham. Uh, obviously a major company within the pharmaceutical industry. And therefore, George has uh, wide experience of uh, the pharmaceutical industry and uh, uh, industry more generally. Uh, as a result of this, uh, he has actually published um, uh, 350 scientific papers and uh, has been involved in editing and writing uh, over 14 books on the, on the pharmaceutical industry. Um, George is actually a fellow of the Royal Society, where we are now, and uh, also uh, a CBE. Uh, his uh, talk this morning uh, is going to be of, I think, great interest. Uh, it is entitled, um, Synthetic Biology Mapping the Design Principles of Biological Systems and the Rise of Biomimetic Engineering. So, George, welcome. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and my thanks to the uh, organizers for in, uh, inviting me. Uh, this, uh, let me move one forward here. Since I do show a lot of slides, which I know is a terrible affliction, uh, these slides will be available on my website, which is there. So if that facilitates uh, slides passing with great speed and un unable to take uh, uh, notes, and there may be some additional presentations of interest to you there. I think if one reflects on the intellectual product of the last uh, uh, couple of centuries, but particularly the last 50 years with the rise of molecular biology, we're now able to interpret uh, Darwin's wonderful term, talking about phylogenetic diversity as endless forms most beautiful, uh, to be able to go from the complete system, irrespective of what your interests are in the phylogenetic spectrum, to begin to understand the principles of biological design uh, at the molecular level on the other side of the slide. But the world which we now inhabit in order to link the molecular biological uh, organization all the way through to complex systems does require a very sophisticated integration of multiple disciplines as reflected in this Venn diagram. So at one level, the blue circle there, all of the omics technologies, genomics, proteomics, and the last time I Googled it, there were now 73 of them which have been accumulated under the semantic of the omic family. Uh, but much of that, of course, is linked to the evolution of uh, uh, very advanced uh, analytical methodologies which permit us to examine large numbers of uh, analytes within biological systems. 
I've listed systems, synthetic and chemical biology together in the top square because the boundaries between them are certainly blurred and we will become increasingly dependent upon the green circle in terms of not just because we have massive data sets to handle, uh, but there will be very important conceptual frameworks established at a computational and mathematical biology. And as is reflected in the remarks we heard a moment ago by introduction, it is how do we harness this knowledge, knowledge uh, to industrial application. So as the title says, these are blurred boundaries and shared conceptual and technological horizons. Uh, systems biology, one can see many definitions, but I'm using it uh, in a, a relatively simple way, namely, how do we analyze entire organisms to define the functional relationships of the whole system? And so, in short, mapping the design rules to understand what are the three cardinal principles of complex systems, namely robustness, adaptability, and evolvability, and how do we then use that information to instruct us in this seemingly new domain of synthetic biology where the deconstruction of natural systems permits us to think about the rational design of complete de novo systems, but I emphasize de novo systems with predictable behavior. And the long-term horizon, of course, uh, and it's the one that most uh, evokes uh, public commentary and media sensationalism, is the belief that uh, we will at some point, and I'll speculate on it towards the end, as to when we might be able to build completely synthetic cells or organisms that, uh, on which are conferred autonomous uh, abilities to replicate, repair, and exhibit adaptive and evolutionary capabilities. But all of this, in the end, comes down to the intellectual trajectory of understanding the information content embedded in biological systems, somewhat flippantly, digital biology, or building it from bits. Uh, the trajectory that we followed over the past five decades is reflected here in terms of our ability to genetically modify biological systems. Starting in the 1980s, of course, the ability to express single genes in single cells, and just as we'll hear throughout this meeting, the predominant substrate for that has been microorganisms, prokaryotes, but it was the beginning of recombinant DNA technology, and we have clearly seen that generate an entirely uh, new, vibrant, and economically powerful biotechnology uh, sector uh, uh, going well beyond medicine. The new dimension now, of course, is to be able to create uh, multi-gene constructs as opposed to single-gene constructs and insert those into single cells, and we'll spend some time talking about that. The ability to insert multiple genes which are not linked necessarily to the same pathway within the cell, but uh, probably the... Uh, the, the most formidable achievements to date have been in genetically modified plants, and the first plants will now go forth this year into the commercial market with 11 different genetic traits endowed in them, ranging from yield, heat tolerance, drought, parasite, and uh, mi microbial resistance. Then, of course, uh, last year, the two blue circles there reflect uh, the work of uh, Ham Smith and Craig Venter, uh, in producing a semi-synthetic cell in terms of a fully synthetic genome inserted into the cytoplasm of a different species to create uh, a semi-synthetic single cell and the so-called challenge of how do you boot up a artificial genome uh, in a different uh, uh, substrate. And then, of course, you have the evolving world of both embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent uh, pluripotent stem cells as to how far our knowledge of biological systems will permit us to reprogram uh, cell fate and differentiation decisions. So the, in terms of defining synthetic biology as the next era in the e modification of biological systems, many in this audience have indeed been active contributors to this taxonomy here, namely either to take an existing organism and modify it uh, and in one strategy, of course, and since much of this does relate to work being done with uh, uh, prokaryotic microorganisms, how do you define a minimal genome, namely depleting the genome of that original substrate uh, and then inserting additional genes giving rise to the sort of colloquialism plug and play uh, uh, genetics? The alternative strategy, of course, is bottom up where you're trying to build higher order assemblies, including ultimately complete cells and organisms 
by programmed assembly of diverse components. And then the last element is the one we spoke of a moment ago in terms of the ability to modulate uh, cell fate decisions amongst uh, differentiated eukaryotic cells. Engineering has uh, quite appropriately been a, not only a, a, a significant intellectual contributor to uh, the field of synthetic biology, but many of the conceptual frameworks uh, that engineers would apply routinely to anthropogenic systems uh, logically have been extended into uh, uh, biology, uh, such that uh, one, of the, one of the great phrases, of course, coming out of the iGEM program at MIT is, hey, man, we're programming wetware. Uh, that may be a, a little extreme at one level, but it is certainly those four first four bullets specification, standardization, abstraction, and decoupling. And Drew, I'm delighted to see Drew Endy here. And Drew has been particularly eloquent in the, emphasizing the importance of decoupling design from fabrication. Because as you move to a point where you can, in fact, define the design specifications for your output, then, of course, you decouple. And in the business world, that permits you to think about entirely new patterns of uh, business model uh, and distributed manufacturing. But nonetheless, there is a key difference, I would submit, as to how far we can uh, uncritically extend principles of uh, uh, engineering uh, in the man-made world into the biological systems under these two principles of context and optimality. Uh, because these are unique features and uh, context still looms large as a technical obstacle for us in terms of being able to move genes uh, with great facileness between uh, different uh, biological systems. It will eventually become clear as to what the nature of that context challenge is. An optimality, of course, is the fact that cells will adapt uh, their expression profiles to optimize cost-benefit in the face of intense selection pressures. So is this, in fact, uh, uh, how far can we extrapolate uh, engineering principles into predictive biology? Because I come back to the principle defined earlier, namely design with predictable behavior, which, of course, is a central tenet in classical engineering. But in biology, we have this lurking complexity uh, that barely does justice to one bullet, namely a nonlinear relationship with the in between the information embedded in the genome and the final manifestation of that encoded information in terms of what the organism uh, becomes. Uh, biological systems are awash with stochastic events and noise, and our interpretation of those is still somewhat limited. And the behavior of parts assembled into modules, assembled into pathways, assembled into subnetworks may exhibit quite different behavior depending upon the pre-existing state space into which they're then uh, inserted. And unlike biological systems, although anthropogenic uh, engineering clearly is designed to display robustness, very few exhibit adaptive evolvability. And biological systems have this cardinal characteristic of the ability to exhibit emergent uh, properties, which in many instances are entirely unpredictable. So at risk of belaboring the obvious to some in this audience, if we are to be successful in this endeavor, we have to look at synthetic biology as you would any complex problem as an end-to-end -end solution, all of which require uh, the integration of complex uh, skills. But it starts by definition with the code. How do you define the parts that you want to assemble into uh, your desired output? in how do you then order the genome that you want to insert into what at least uh, has come to be known as the recipient's chassis. Uh, the once inserted, how do you uh, ensure that that efficiency of insertion is optimum? Uh, how do you then build the pathway or network that you wish to achieve? And then moving into the industrial domain, how does that modified organism then lend itself to the industrial process you're interested in. And then quite appropriately, depending upon application, there are various complexities that relate to the patterns of risk, regulation, and responsibility under the broad framework of societal uh, oversight. So I'd at least like to come back for a few minutes to talk about this issue of defining the chassis, whether it be a microorganism or a eukaryotic cell. But most of the work to date has been done within microorganisms, and so the, the, the challenge is how do you in fact design the, the search for what is called the universal chassis, or at least a, 
uh, a standard number of workhorses as it would be for industry, namely organisms which can be modified with a degree of proficiency, efficiency, and reproducibility. Uh, and that when you insert a new genetic construct into that substrate, the recipient cell doesn't really pay a fitness penalty for having that new construct associated with it. Equally important, biology always retreats to a homeostasis norm as far as possible, and uh, in many instances is a, 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 an intense desire to remove what has been introduced. And in certain applications, of course, there is a desire that you actually equip the modified organism with a kill switch such that it cannot survive in environments that you would not wish it to uh, enter. And although, clearly, there are very elegant examples of genetic modification of uh, microorganisms that uh, we'll hear more about during the course of this meeting, we only have relatively limited insights into how we optimize the chassis that we, into which we put these genetic uh, constructs. And I think if you take two very closely related uh, organisms such as Klebsiella and E. coli, they may have many highly conserved elements of their genome, but also show very significant variations in their genome, which makes it very difficult to port genes from one organism uh, to another. But nonetheless, the, the, the design principles are now engaged. Uh, a number of uh, very eloquent uh, studies reported in the literature uh, where you want to design a particular metabolic pathway, particularly for industrial application. So what are then the underlying operon networks of genes you would need to put in place for each of those sequential steps in a complex metabolic pathway? But equally, because this is a dynamic system, it isn't just simply the question of assembling the requisite coding components. You've got to balance the kinetic dynamics of all of the various steps in that reaction pathway, because if something at the proximal end uh, is running at too, rate, too fast a rate, you get intermediate buildups that can be toxic and so forth. So you've got to have a very careful titration of the dynamics of each step uh, with, within uh, the pathway and a number of very ingenious ways of being reflected to try and achieve that balance in the various steps such that recent paper from Nature Reviews Microbiology, uh, one uh, on the uh, uh, far left there is the fact that you actually create spatial linkages between the reaction components such that you then created the spatial localization whereby these are, uh, have the greatest opportunity to interaction. Alternatively, you can try and design a compartment into which particular parts of the reaction sequence go. And if you then extend that to broader interactions in microbial communities such as biofilms, you actually juxtapose the organisms to each other. You also need uh, very clever techniques to uh, control uh, the number of, in this case, enzymes but reaction steps in a particular pathway, either through allosteric control or alternatively the chronobiology of just-in-time gene expression and also uh, the beginnings of uh, early insights to design circuit controls where you can, in fact, uh, exhibit uh, the synchronization of particular pathways. But this is still a very challenging exercise. The, this is from the uh, uh, Gibson et al., so that's the Ham Smith, Craig Venter paper I referred to uh, earlier. So the first very complex synthetic genome to be established, but still uh, set against the genome, the multi-chromosome genome of eukaryotes, still a relatively limited exercise. But I raise it not just to praise uh, the, the nature of the uh, synthetic assembly, but it's really this point. This is the threshold of big biology. If you look at the work of Jay Teasling's group, uh, reported back in 2006 in relation to uh, bioprocess engineering for the production of an anti-malarial uh, compound, uh, the construction of that gene network was 150 person years. The genome I just showed you was estimated to be 400 million, uh, 400 million years, could be, uh, uh, 400 person years at an estimated cost of somewhere uh, in the region of $62 million. Now, clearly that uh, cost uh, curve is going to drop dramatically as it does with every technology, but this is not exactly on the threshold of uh, uh, garage biohacking at this stage. The other, another parallel approach, of course, is the use of so-called protocells, whereby 
you look at this in the context of what might have been the early biotic phase of the rise of life, uh, whereby uh, the reactants involved uh, are encapsulated within typically lipid membranes, but they can also be synthetic polymers, and how can you, in fact, introduce the requisite components to sustain uh, the reactions you're interested in. This is still is a very fertile field of intellectual inquiry from the standpoint of inserting, uh, whether it be coding materials or uh, protein expression and metabolic pathways, but this is, of course, by definition, a much more complex exercise if you actually wanted to create anything that had an, autonom or an autonomous replicative capacity because the challenge of how you uh, engineer a program to allow partition of fission of that vesicle into two equal sister vesicles uh, with uh, appropriate demarcation of content. Uh, and it also carries uh, a much higher barrier for the design of those key traits of adaptation and evolution. So let's come to some of the emergent uh, applications. I think any of us who look at uh, uh, the microbial world are in awe of the products of four billion years of evolution because uh, every eco niche you look at, whether it be the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, pastoral elements there to the Atacama Desert to deep smoking, uh, vents uh, with lethal concentrations of temperature and toxic materials in sub-ocean vents to Antarctica to hot springs and then to our own lurking microbiota. Most of us are carrying near the order of one and a half to two kilos of microorganisms uh, in our body. So every eco niche that you can examine you will find uh, microorganisms and so this issue of how this extravagant functional diversity, what is the underlying information content to this, begins the field of so-called metagenomics because we are, uh, it is, there is an estimated 100 billion microbial species and I don't know what the error rate is in that particular projection, but what we do know is that we can currently only cultivate about 6,000 species and, um, and no matter how instructed those are, there is a huge genetic diversity yet to be tapped, particularly out of the so-called extremophiles, namely organisms that can exist in some of those rather hellish environments that we spoke of. So it is the question of how you can begin to sample the genomic inventory in that extravagant diversity, and then, of course, you will then face this issue of context uh, challenge as to how, how facile the translation of particular genes of interest into an industrial uh, programmable chassis uh, would work. There is, as many of you know, uh, now a major project to begin to understand uh, the microbial diversity on Earth, uh, but one thing that is already beginning to become emergent, and I'll touch on this in a moment, is the fact that in many instances there is a very sophisticated ecology amongst microbial communities that organisms tend to have a preferential association with other organisms, and in fact you have not just the sociobiology, uh, but much of this relates to uh, uh, exchange of nutrients and codependency amongst them, and we're only just beginning to understand the nature of those relationships. And of course, as all of this information becomes available, this then, uh, I can't do justice to any one of these topics today, but Dick asked me to give a sort of broad overview. This means that we've also got to have uh, ever more sophisticated capabilities in bioinformatics and high performance computing, not only to analyze the phylogenetic relationships between organisms and particular metabolic pathways within those organisms, how then can we begin to design uh, the rule sets uh, that will permit us to uh, implement uh, design with greater efficiency and equally predictability. We as biologists stand indicted for absolute sloppiness in the last 50 years in terms of our unwillingness to adopt a rigid uh, semantic and ontology for what we do and describe, uh, and we've got to do far better in this regard. And as these data sets become ever larger, uh, that not enough attention is being paid both in industry and certainly for the funding agencies of academia as to how you create the computational infrastructure, but equally importantly, a cadre of su suitably skilled bioinformaticians to actually enable you to undertake these tasks because 
carried to where we would like it, we would like to embrace the engineering principle of computer-assisted design, that our insights into biological complexity and biological design permit you then uh, to have uh, an increasingly sophisticated iterative cycle between computational design, experiment in the lab, so dry, wet iteration, uh, but moving towards a point where you can, in fact, uh, uh, program automated design and have a graphical user interface capability, uh, because this will then enable us to model biological systems of increasing complexity. But as I've already made, already made reference to, one of the other features of biological systems which is ubiquitous is the existence of nonlinear phenomena and the complexity of what is required uh, to model those has yet to be fully confronted. Uh, but as was stated in the introduction, this is a field which at least in theoretical terms you can, whichever particular uh, element of this slide you would like to talk about, you could hold a three-day uh, symposium in terms of this, at least the theoretical appeal uh, of this, but uh, I certainly am uh, convinced, and I hope even in the short time I have, I'll be able to show you a few examples, that this is clearly a field which is now attracting significant uh, industrial uh, interest, because it's really bio-inspired systems engineering. How can you exploit the design of new synthetic pathways to produce molecules either of sufficient structural complexity that we cannot produce with conventional manufacturing technologies, but equally important, it offers the opportunity to start addressing the, uh, the crucial issue of how do we continue to produce materials that do not deplete natural resources, and in that sense, how do we mimic the efficiency of natural ecosystems, how far can we in fact utilize the extraordinary efficiency of natural uh, uh, e uh, uh, metabolic processes to eliminate uh, uh, waste streams. By adopting biological systems, can we in fact move ma much manufacturing to room temperature, eliminate the use of large volumes of uh, uh, organic solvents and toxic materials, and then eventually this point already made, decoupling design from fabrication means that I can essentially send the design to distributed manufacturing units and of course uh, in not just in conventional industry but certainly from a military standpoint the ability to say manufacture fuel. I mean the United States in its current uh, military campaigns the fully costed cost of the distribution of a gallon of fuel uh, that's the U.S. gallon, but it would be somewhat comparable, of course. Uh, a gallon of fuel to the front line is almost $500 when you look at the fully distributed logistical costs, so distributed manufacturing has great appeal. So in that context, what I've called the race to the pump, and I've not qualified it with dollars, euros, uh, or anything else, but I would also add an Asiatic uh, currency, you can guess which one, uh, to that. This is, an era, uh, this is an era where many companies, both large companies, as you can see there, we're going to hear, hear from Shell later, but Shell, BP, Chevron, uh, but even without the Exxon Mobil and uh, conflict declared, because I'm on the uh, scientific advisory board of synthetic uh, genomics, but nonetheless, whether it be classic entrepreneurial companies or linkages between large companies and small companies, this is a field which is attracting enormous attention. And it is, as the slide says, revenue potential. There's uh, significant revenue potential along the entire biomass chain, whether it be starting at the far end in terms of the production of material as agricultural inputs, all the way across that chain to the final production of uh, fuels. And I appreciate these slides come by uh, with sufficient speed that note taking is difficult and hence why uh, uh, please feel free to go to the website because this is the issue. Just in the US alone, we have 600 million wet tons of biomass a year which can in fact be utilized. Uh, and so whether you want to live with the world, which I think is increasingly delusional with regard to uh, uh, corn-based ethanol, uh, uh, all the way through to other uh, crops. Uh, this is nonetheless a field attracting substantial uh, interest. One of the most interesting ones is this, uh, the overbuilding of corn-based ethanol plants in the United States, but now being retrofitted to be able to use uh, genetically modified yeast for the production of biobutanol, uh, which has a far greater uh, diversity of use as a, as a feedstock. 
The other issue, of course, is a great interest in reducing dependency upon petrochemicals, not just from the transportation sector, but this is, of course, the central feedstock for a very substantial global industry with over 70,000 product, products produced in those four sectors. And in each of those, whether it be specialty or commodity chemicals, agriculture or biofarm, uh, one is now beginning to see uh, the applications of interest in synthetic biology rise in each of these industries. And of course, starting with uh, intensive genetic modification of major staples such as corn and soy, uh, but now extending that across a broad spectrum of agricultural uh, products. Uh, one that we do not expect to be uh, immediately uh, available courtesy of uh, synthetic biology, uh, but nonetheless, this is uh, 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 an area in which modification of microorganisms is attracting industrial interest again. Uh, the capacity of microbes to live in these extraordinary environments, whether it be the nature of potentially lethal uh, materials and in injurious materials in the waste stream, uh, very high temperatures, uh, extremes of pH, uh, the ability of microorganisms to actually uh, metabolize many of the toxic materials uh, is uh, stimulating interest in the utilization of this, particularly for bioremediation, albeit in closed reactor systems as opposed to release into the general environment. Uh, but the mining industry is, is one that is uh, certainly engaged now. The Chilean National Copper Company has got some of the most interesting IP on extremophiles, if you actually want to go and look at that from the standpoint of modulation of acid mine waste. But I come back again to this issue of microbial community dynamics. Many of these processes are completely dependent not upon a single organism, but a complex uh, meta-community of organisms, and we've known for a very long time in the fermentation industry and areas like uh, waste sludge management in sewage and so forth, that you actually have to have an optimum uh, ecology between these organisms. And so whether it be in terms of synthetic bioprocesses or this other issue of biofilms, and so here's a recent paper utilizing molecular biological methods to profile uh, wastewater coming out of breweries in California uh, looking at the fluctuating nature of the microbial species involved and the need to maintain specific uh, fractions of particular organisms in order to have uh, optimum productivity. And then into biofilms, which are in fact the dominant form of microbial life, we know comparatively little about the transfer of planktonic forms into sessile uh, uh, microfilm of uh, biofilms, but shown in the green box is where we would like to exploit them, and shown in the red box is where they cause us problems. And so, uh, Paul, it's nice to see you here. Uh, we just had a meeting in Washington recently on elements of synthetic biology and biofilm uh, genesis and modulation uh, was a significant factor. But on the positive side, whether it be in terms of the utilization of biofilms of organisms for removal of materials from waste streams, optimizing bioreactors, ongoing work now in microbial fuel cells, and the utilization of biofilms as sensors uh, are all receiving significant attention. And then, of course, uh, at least nearer to uh, my own particular interest is the growing problem under bullet two there, antibiotic-resistant infections uh, in uh, uh, humans, but also extending that to animals and plants. Uh, but we've already mentioned this uh, uh, new community that we are beginning to just make our first insights into insofar as it is a complex meta system, but primarily the microbiota associated with the GI tract and growing insights into uh, how far modulation of the microbial species within that microbiome can not only affect health, uh, but also may be of great significance from the standpoint of metabolic liabilities, both to sustain health, but also predisposed to disease. And for those of you who have not seen it, there's just been a, uh, a special issue of the National Academy of Sciences, which gives a very comprehensive overview of our evolving knowledge of the human microbiome. But of course, it is not uh, without relevance to many other species and the ability to modify the metabolic conversion efficiency 
of uh, food production animals is an area uh, of, of, of significant increasing uh, investment. Uh, and I put these rather elegant uh, uh, studies by Luke Geram in terms of the uh, glass models of various elements of uh, well, phage there, but uh, other microbes from the standpoint of using microorganisms as delivery systems in their own right, either to modify the microbiota that lurk within us or alternatively to de decorate those microbes by sophisticated display of materials, so whether it be antigens from the standpoint of vaccines or selective release of modulators uh, within uh, the gut or the screening of large numbers of proteins for enzymic uh, efficiency uh, or as, as vaccines. So that then is the prelude to moving from cellular systems to cell-free systems because uh, it, what I've referred to here is expanding functional chemical and biological space by creating orthogonal approaches where you incorporate non-natural components, whether it be nucleotides, uh, chiral changes in amino acids, engineering ribosomes to take novel transfer RNAs, and then uh, to apply these in living systems, but equally important in terms of cell-free systems. How do we, in fact, uh, use directed evolution technologies to look at the capacity to expand functional space so whether it be directed evolution of proteins, where most of the attention has been directed, particularly from the standpoint of designing enzymes that display altered kinetics or altered substrate promiscuities, but the same techniques, namely the ability to produce very large numbers of variants of a particular protein or an RNA, and then compare the, the functional repertoire of that library you've created relative to the uh, original precursor uh, is opening up a, a number of avenues of uh, substantial interest in industry, particularly in terms of bioprocess uh, enzymology, but the incorporation of non-natural components uh, is uh, an area in which uh, we will undoubtedly see much going on, and equally, this is where, again, you have convergence with engineering in terms of the ability to modulate substrates, look at directed evolution methodologies for changing uh, reaction kinetics, whether in solution or uh, interface systems, and even somewhat sort of uh, speculatively here, the emergence of molecular robotics, namely molecules that can in fact change their position uh, in uh, space and trigger uh, reaction frameworks. Because all of this in turn comes down to this. How do we control directed molecular assembly of interactants and that opens up an entirely new capacity to not only uh, engineer biological reactions, but also interface uh, biological uh, systems with abiotic inorganic uh, systems and the ability to spatially control and program the reactions uh, occurring on these is important. And the ability to uh, initiate self-assembly reactions where you nucleate around a particular set of precursors that then enable more complex hierarchical structures uh, to be built. And this has obvious relevance too for the design of novel sensors uh, and molecular motors. And also the derivatization of surfaces with biological mediators. And so just two examples shown here, namely not only exploiting differences in the mechanical properties of the substrate to induce a cell uh, to exhibit certain behaviors. But if we are going to leverage fully the differentiated capacity of stem cell populations, we're going to have to understand what are the inductive signals and putting those on particular substrates will in fact be uh, what I think is going to be a long journey, but nonetheless a fascinating one, of how do you reprogram embryonic stem cells or induce pluripotent stem cells uh, to build uh, extravagant organotypic structures such as the liver and reproduce this extraordinary uh, histiotypic assemblies that we see uh, in biological systems. This is undoubtedly going to be a great intellectual endeavor and uh, it, it's engaged, but I suspect that it's going to take a substantial amount of time. Then, of course, in closing, we come to the policy issues and even a more sober uh, publication like The Economist refers to making life 
that has not yet been achieved. I referred to that earlier as a semi-synthetic cell. It is a prodigious intellectual feat by Craig, Ham, and their team, but it clearly does show that program genome assembly is gaining in complexity and sophistication, and it has therefore triggered a new growth industry of uh, uh, large numbers of reports issued primarily uh, as much from the standpoint of risk to the environment and the second issue, uh, risk of so-called dual-use technologies, namely the same information being used for both beneficent and malevolent uh, uh, purposes, and the, uh, these studies continue, and the Nuffield Council, as many of you know, has just issued a consultation paper not specifically on synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is one of several emerging technologies, and certainly it will be interesting to hear from the Minister tomorrow uh, in terms of is this country fully recognizing the importance of biotechnology uh, in the future economic welfare uh, of, of the nation. But where the frameworks of reference have come have primarily been, and fully appropriately, biosafety, what is the risk from legitimate application of this technology, biosecurity, which is the dual-use element from the standpoint of malevolent uh, utility, and how feasible is this issue of sort of bio hacking and the sort of three frameworks that have come out as shown in the bottom, namely uh, implementation of uh, new procedures to screen who is buying particularly uh, uh, gene constructs and supply, voluntary codes of conduct at one level within the industry is shown there, but undoubtedly also buttressed by regulation and legislation. But all of this will mean little if it is done on an individual state basis. It has clearly got to have a framework of international harmonization. So, Dick, uh, I, I, my thanks for inviting me. I think that uh, I genuinely believe that we are now on the cusp of a new era in the life sciences that moves us, the, uh, uh, a trajectory that's been underway for many decades to move us from being people who just merely describe phenomena to actually map design principles. But I think what we're also now seeing is the fact that what was the biotechnology industry is now also keeping pace with this in terms of looking at sophisticated industrial application. And so the design principles applied to uh, cells, cell-free systems, or to materials, the opportunity is substantial. The substrates are diverse, even though much of the activity is with prokaryotes to date. It will move to eukaryotes and to synthetic cells and to devices and machines, the applications uh, myriad. It will involve new manufacturing platforms and architectures, and by definition, policy has got to look at that in the context of over commerce, commerce, oversight and regulation, and dual use. This is my own speculation, speculation on the overall uh, evolution uh, of this field. Uh, time along the horizontal access, technical complexity, and competitiveness, and the need I emphasize cross-disciplinary capabilities on the vertical axes. The purple circles reflect, in my opinion, the momentum which is already underway in the utilization of synthetic biology to design uh, commercially viable biosynthetic processes and bio-inspired materials, and directed evolution methods are part of that. Uh, in, over the next decade, we will increasingly understand extremophile biology, and I think much to, exists there for leverage into the industrial sector, and we'll also see microorganisms engineered for biomedicine. Then in the second decade, perhaps we will begin to see the uh, predictable reprogramming of human cell images for regenerative medicine, and then perhaps towards the end of that decade, uh, de novo design of fully synthetic organisms, probably starting in the prokaryotic domain, but I think that, uh, and clearly with the emphasis on uh, contained organisms. So I think there are four spaces that we're looking at here, as I've called them, in terms of biospace. The coding space, what is the genetic uh, uh, underpinning uh, of phylogeny and the utilization of metagenomics to understand that? How far do commonalities of design principle inform us in the design space? 
diversity space, of course, is linked back to coding space, but those other disciplines shown there are important. But unexplored biospace also uh, embraces chemical biology, the ability to use non-natural components and to design completely novel uh, uh, xenobiotic systems. And so, in closing, I think we have an interesting element of our challenge, and certainly for the next generations to come, managing the global commons. How do we understand complex adaptive systems? So the distribution and control of resources is a global issue. It's intimately linked to not only human welfare, but also industrial competitiveness. So we have resources and then the drivers that underpin that. But we're faced with a world in which we are now seeing infinite demand against finite resource and how do we allocate that under the broad rubric of sustainability. And then intellectually, we've got a very interesting challenge that certain resources on the face of the earth are actually expanding. Uh, the infocosm is one, but I would argue that synthetic diversity, even well short of designing synthetic, full synthetic organisms, just our ability to design productive applications of novel genetic constructs increases synthetic uh, uh, diversity. And so uh, that is really the broad conceptual framework in which we exist. And I'd like to close by arguing that the enormous potential of this field nonetheless is also going to require building new transdisciplinary knowledge networks in a way we have not done before. This is not silos subvert solutions. I apologize for the alliteration there. But nonetheless, our entire underpinning, particularly in academia, is singly ill-suited to the leverage of this technology. Uh, engineering schools are probably better suited because they, are, they in, intrinsically link to application. Uh, but for the most part, if we are to fully leverage the enormous opportunities which synthetic biology and biomimetic engineering offer, both the way we organize in the academy and the way the funding agencies respond to this, and equally importantly, our education and training capabilities have got to reflect the ability to assemble and educate uh, individuals with the ability to see these very complex uh, frameworks and equally uh, the disruptive potential that these technologies will pose to industry dictates they too must be introspective with regard to their functional competency for the future. So uh, with apologies that that is a superficial surf across a very broad range of uh, materials, I hope nonetheless it provides a suitable introductory uh, uh, background to the talks that will follow. And again, I thank the co-organizers for not only the invitation, but for putting together the first of these six academy meetings. Thank you very much.